Hey everyone, welcome back to the lineup. I'm LJ. I'm Mike. And we have a uh, former major leaguer, Mets superstar, and my father, Lee Mazzilli. <laughs> the Italian stallion. <laughs> What's going and on? And his and his father too. Damn right. In law. Yeah. Damn right. Future father in law. Yep. That's right. I'm What's up, lucky, guys? I'm How are you guys guy. doing? How's the show going? Good? Good. Yeah, everything's good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Speaking. I'm here in uh uh home with my uh, little Italian uh, big spaghetti uh, portrait. That's right. That's oh, that's when uh, when I was a little kid and teasing mom. She, that's, that's she right. threw the spatula at me. <laughs> that's right. For, and that's broke right. that. Mom, yeah. mom got that for us. That's right. That's, that's, so that's what we kept. Did we reframe Sunday, that? Sunday dinners. Yeah. Sunday <laughs> dinners at the Mazzilli. <laughs> yeah, so speaking about the Mets um, and, and the Yankees, uh, lots going on, underachieving right now. What do you, what do you think about everything? I think that's the uh, uh, appropriate word right now. I think they're both underachieving. I just they're not playing well. I don't think uh, they've hit their stride. Guys are not hitting on the team on both sides. Um, you know, they've been hit with some injuries uh, uh, at times. You know, a couple of their starters, Scherzer and Verlander, went down. But you know how it is, Mike and LJ. Uh, you know, teams are applauding the injuries to the opposing teams. Mm. You know, they don't feel sorry for you that mm -hmm. you lost your top two guys. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with the Yankees. You know, uh, when guys go down, you know, other teams are happy. You know, that, that, you know, they just know that it's part of the game and sooner or later they're going to come back. But when a team is down, you you know, you, you want to kind of, you know, step on their legs, so to speak. But, you know, for me, they just, they're not playing well. They're, they're not hitting. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this Met team that, you know, coming into spring training, you know, you they look like a phenomenal team, but, you know, their main guys are underachieving, like you're saying. You know, you, you look, you know, Nimmo's playing well, you know, he's hitting well. I'm, t I'm just looking at some of their stuff, but, you know, the, their main guy, Lindor, is hitting 220, and, um, and Marte's been. hitting 230. Tan is hitting 230. Uh, Escobar's has not had a good year at all, and they just called up the Antos uh, to see if he can – add some spark to their lineup, but uh, they're underachieving offensively, and you wouldn't think that going into the season, but they need to, to step it up a gear. You know, fortunately for the Mets right now, you know, they're not playing well, but, you know, the Braves are going into a little funk right now as well. So as bad as the Mets are, they're, they're six, six and a half games out. Mm. So, you know, we, we both, all three of us know that it's a marathon. Um you know, so there's no panic button, but uh, you could be six and a half and, you know, in a week or two, you could be 12 games out as well. So, yeah. And the same thing with the Yankees. I, I don't see any of the Yankees really, you know, Rizzo's doing really well. I mean, he's put them on their back and, you know, judge is judge. Uh, he's starting to, you know, he got hurt for a couple of weeks, but he's starting to come into his own. And, you know, he's got 11 home runs and, yeah. uh, you know, yesterday, I think he started, or two days ago when he played against the Blue Jays, um, <laughs> they made a mistake when they were getting on him. Yeah. Um, uh, and, Tim, and Toronto got upset. Yeah. And they just poked the bear. You don't do that. You don't do that. You know, it was like, it, it, you, you know, both of you know Aaron Judge with time the first thing yeah. he doesn't say much and he goes out there and, and he just you ticked him off you just you kind of pissed him off when you did that and then you know yeah, they went out and hit two home runs and does what he does mm -hmm. so don't poke the bear man. that's what they did but um yeah they they uh the yankees the yankees are not the team that you know we're accustomed to seeing all the superstars on the field just you know they have a lot of guys that are role players um and, and you know, you, do you think that that's kind of like uh, something that both teams weren't prepared for with their star signings and and players when they get hurt? Uh, they're not like a system like the Dodgers where they have guys that are ready to come up and perform right away. You don't want to say you're not prepared, you know, coming out of spring training. You have to know that. I think uh, they know their team. But when you sign two guys that are 39 years old and, and you know, listen, they're both Hall of Fame pitchers. They're great pitches and you know you can't take anything away from what they can do but 
you can't expect them to go out and, and have 30, 35 starts in the season. That's just not going to happen. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, so you have to have something down below or something that you could put into that mix to counteract when those guys are out or miss a start. Uh, you know, we, we know that, you know, when you're 37, 38, 39, and you get to that age, I, I watched Verlander pitch last night. And, and he got roughed up a little bit, gave up a couple home runs. But, you know, at 39, he was still throwing 95, 96. Mm-hmm. So it's there. It's in the tank. But now he's just building his way up to get, you know, to where he should be in, you know, mid-June. You know, he's still, he's a month, you know, a few weeks behind. But the quality of stuff is there for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, don't forget, like I said, you just you don't bounce back as quick. Sometimes you need to give these guys an extra day of rest as well. So, uh, you know, it's 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 a challenge, and I think that's what you know Mets and Buckshaw Wolfer he's he's trying to find that you know that one lineup that you can kind of ride the wave with, you know, and push the envelope with. And you know, a lot of guys, uh, you know, even and I'm not I'm not too sure. That is something I, I, I would like. I mean, you guys both played, you know. I mean, how, how do you feel when you come to the ballpark um, every day and one day you're hitting second and the next day you're hitting sixth, you know, and then you come back, get a couple of hits, and you're hitting seventh. And then yeah. you're back to, this, you know, first leading off. What does that do for you? We, I mean, we I, just I, talked about that with Devin. Good. Devin Marrera was just on and he – He's always been a starter from college to right. minor leagues, and then all of a sudden he's on the Red Sox role playing, and it's mm-hmm. it's a big culture shock. But he had a good mindset on it, and obviously the the cliche is controlling what you can control. Easier said than done when it's the first time right. you're doing it at the highest level. So it does stuff to your confidence, and you, you just got to have good people around you on that team. Devin talked about the Red Sox being their main focus is winning. That helps mm-hmm. anyone when it comes into a situation like that. Like you, you become unselfish and understand your background, and and that's how you can kind of come. Like when I was with the Cubs, it wasn't that case. It wasn't that case. I was a role guy, but off lefties and out of my comfort zone. Everyone's miserable. We're losing. It's just a totally right. different atmosphere. So it depends on where you are and who you're surrounded with. Yeah, but not in New York. Not in New York. You have none of that. No. Uh, it, it, you're, you're there for a job you do it here yep. but you know as a player and yep. being an everyday player in mm-hmm. the lineup you know you want to have consistency of you know where you're at uh, i yeah. think that i think it has a lot to do with a yeah with a player's mindset um you know i, I never particularly like judge hitting second i know analytically they look to put the one of your top hitters in in that second spot um but I, I like him in the third spot. I, I, I even think he likes hitting third. Um, he, he That's an RBI spot. You know, he's got mm-hmm. 11 home runs. He's got 25 or six RBI, you know, and and he loses that, you know, that three-run home run. I know you get up, they say, 15 to 18 more times during the course of a year. Um, he spots in the second spot. But, you know, I think what the Yankees are missing is that one guy – uh, for me, that is a table setter at the top of the yeah. order. Uh, you need a guy to get on base for the big guys, for Rizzo, for Judge. Um, and, you know, Nimmo's that for the Mets. You know, he gets on, and you know, Nimmo's done a great job this year of getting on base, being patient. And I, I don't – the Yankees don't have that one guy. You know, maybe Volpe will be. I was thinking I, I like him. I like his actions. You know, he, he's struggling, struggling a little bit. With his average, but that's that's a given in this game. Yeah, you know? and he's only I mean, twenty-one. You just don't overtake this league in, in one month, but he has all the uh, he has all the skill set to be a great player. I mean, I, I watch him. I like his enthusiasm. He creates excitement on the bases, um, you know. But it's different from you know. And then when you get back in the seven hole or eight hole, as opposed to leading off. So yep. you know, he let off for a little bit, and you know he's. He's an aggressive hitter. He doesn't look like he's uh, a guy that's going to walk a lot. You know, get he he wants to swing the bat, which is a fine, yeah. you know, which is fine. But you know, that's something I think the Yankees have always kind of looked for. Uh, I don't know since Gito left, the, the, yeah. the guy that you can just 
put in that leadoff spot and not worry about that and set the table for the for the other guys. You know, I don't worry about so much what you hit. I, I you know, I, I was always even when I coached or manage, I, I was always a, a big on base guy for me. I've always wanted guys to get on base. You got guys that are on base that can that can create havoc and set the table. So I'd rather have a guy I'm saying a leadoff hitter. I'd rather have a leadoff hitter that hits 260, let's say. Let's just say 260, right? But his on-base percentage is around 400. Mm -hmm. That's the guy I want because mm -hmm. he's going to set the role. He's going to set the table. Things change when guys are on bases. Pitches change when guys are on bases. They're conscious of guys that are on bases. It creates havoc. Speed creates havoc on defense all over. You need that. And you both know that in the last year or two, the game has changed from from the analytically driven uh, home run or strikeout type of a player. Now it's back to the well-rounded player. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy that hits 270, 280, hits 20 to 25 home runs, knocks in 80, 90 runs a year, you know, steals 20 bases. That's what they're looking for, that well-rounded player now because the game has changed. And that's yeah. what you need to set the table with offense. I think I got a question. So you've been, you've obviously managed, you've been with coaching with the Yankees as well. You got either the Mets or Yankees that are stumbling along right here. What do you do as a manager to try and pick up things or get guys going? Is it, uh, I don't know, it's it's tough to pick the right thing to say with what's going to get a team going, but is there stuff that you would be doing to try and get mm -hmm. guys loose? Well, bef before you answer that, well, I want to just mention, I remember you telling me the story about Jeter and his slump, right? Over 30 or whatever. And he, he went into Girardi's office and said, Hey, let me, leave me there two more weeks. L let me show you. Uh, let me get out of this. A week. A, a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that something that you would do? Well, you know, that's something that you trust your players. You know, the one thing that as a manager, you need to trust your players. And um, I think and Girardi at the time was the manager. I trusted Jeter. You know, he had a track record. Um, you know, sometimes guys can find it on their own and some can't, you know. So what do you do as a manager? There's a lot of things you try to do, but I think you need to, you know, individually talk to players. You know, you got to constantly, um, you know, pat them on the back, um, you know, give encouragement, you know, because we know as, as, as ball players. Everything is negative in baseball. Everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So if I hit, um, let's say, and I hit uh, twenty home runs, and then they're going to say, "Yeah, but you only had fifty RBI." You know what I'm saying? Or you know, you play on defense. Yeah, but I did. Yeah, but you didn't do this. But you struck out this many times. You know, there's always a negative in baseball, and we know you both played that we we always try to fight that negativity. So. I'm going to fail seven out of 10 times to be a great player, you know? So how do I get that back? How do I try to shorten that period to where I can succeed more? And a lot of it has to do with your manager and your manager's confidence in you as a player. Mm -hmm. um, so you me... both know that when you played and the manager, I'm not, I'm not going to say avoid you, but you don't speak to your manager, right? Yeah. Or your manager hasn't spoken to you and, three or four days and you're going to ballpark every day. Don't you both wonder like, yeah. oh, what did I do? Am I going to play anymore? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you have that feeling, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a big part of that, you know, getting to, to you guys. And, you know, some guys want to kick on in the butt and some guys just want to pat on the back. Mm -hmm. So you, that's the hardest part about managing is you got 25, 26 guys now is to find out what it's going to take to kick off this one particular guy. You can't get right. them all going at the same time. Right. So I want to I want to say, remember when I was in Savannah um, with with Luis Rojas as my manager, and I was right. struggling. <clears throat> I was hitting under two hundred, maybe two months into the season, and he came up to me one day. He said, "Hey, today's the day, right? Today's the day. You got a few in you," and it kind of rejuvenated me a little bit. And then I went over again, and the next day he calls me in his office and he goes, "LJ, right. you're playing every day and you're hitting third. Nothing's going to change. Just yeah. go out there and do your thing." As soon as he said that, I took off. Remember that? So uh, my question is, if you were the manager right now and you said you need a spark at the top of the lineup, right. somebody right. like Volpe, and, but you're also you're, you're in the Yankees, you're expected to win. At what point do you 
take a rookie like that and 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 give him the confidence to assume the role as being the leadoff hitter, to let him get in his in his own groove. Because like I said, he's 21 years old. He's young. He's got good actions, but he's sporadic right. throughout the lineup. One through nine, he'll you know he'll hit mm-hmm. wh- wherever. At what point do you, while you're trying to win, tell the front office or Volpe saying, hey, you're in the leadoff role. This is your spot. Go out there and play your game. Right. That, 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 that's a great question, uh, especially with with uh, Volpe because he, he has a lot of talent, you know. And sometimes, you like you like when you were playing, you're over trying to overachieve and doing more than you're capable of. And I've always said that, you know, do the things that got you to the big leagues, right? There's a reason why you got to the big leagues because of what you have done, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I've always said, don't don't change your swing, don't change your approach because this is the play we signed, this is the play we like. So it's a very this it, it, it's a great question because I don't know if there's a fine line. It's it's going to be something to where uh, management is going to say. You know what? We're sticking with this. You know, this is it. We're gonna we're gonna go through some some rough patches right now, but this is what we see him as, and this is where we're gonna leave him. We're not gonna move him around a lot. And then on the other hand, you're gonna say, but we're we're a New York team. We need to win now. Yeah. So you gotta balance that. You know. So you know, from a manager's point, there's two things that a manager is graded on. Two things. Two. That's it. Two. Is the and you need double twos. Two things. I mean, what is, I mean, what is that? You could be the nicest guy in the world, but what are the two things, two words that a manager is graded on? Wins and losses. That's it. Boom. That's it. Nice. Dude, nice. That's it, my man. Nice job. That's it. You could be the nicest guy in the world and not win. You're gone. Yeah. You could be a, such a real, you know, um, you say, tankers, you say, mean, there's tough managers out there, and they win every year. And those are the guys that management wants. So um, that's what the manager's graded on, wins and losses. So they have to find that, you know, and you need to have that good relationship with uh, manager and front office. There has to be an unbreakable bond when you manage and you have a general manager. You know, so you, both ships need to be sailing in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Now, you can have disagreements, and, and which is fine. And you could say, well, I think this player and the manager is going to say, well, he's not that kind of player. And that's okay. And you have to be able to discuss that. But at the end of it, you know, you got to say, all right, we're in this together. I don't agree with you, but I'm going to try your way. And then we'll see where we're at. Sometimes things change, you know, quickly. So what's the spark? I don't, I don't know how to get one spark. I mean, sometimes you, as a ball club, you can't, you know, let things happen. Sometimes you got to make things happen. Mm. And to make things happen are putting guys in motion, hit and run. Uh, about that, you know, I always, I always feel that base running is a overlooked part of the game, probably one of the biggest parts of the game that is completely overlooked. Because you both know when you're sitting in the dugout and someone on your team really does a great running play, uh, goes first to third or goes from first to home on a, on a, on a, on a not-so-deep ball, it picks the team up. And then, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you see one of your teammates making a dumb move, getting thrown out of second base, takes mm-hmm. the team down, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what is he doing? So, you know, base running to me was always a, a, an overlooked part of the game, and I think it's, it needs to come back into the game. And so, so to get back to what you're saying about a team that, you know, what would you do? Maybe that might be it, you know, getting guys in motion, putting a hit and run on, uh, doing something that yeah. usually is not your, your style of play, but sometimes you have to get out of that realm of, you know, sitting on your hands and not doing anything. And, uh, you have to be able to create, uh, create things out, out on the field. Uh, and I think in game, those are those are great things uh, to do to get the team going. But I think an underrated thing is having a consistent lineup where people know when they come to the park, they know where they're batting every single mm-hmm. day and what position they're playing at, because that gives you that comfortability 
knowing that you're going to be able to keep the momentum from the day before to the next day because you yeah. know you know where you stand. And I was part of that, you know, before baseball kind of took a turn to analytics when I was with Savannah, uh, with mm -hmm. Rojas. The same lineup every single day. We won the championship. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's just because everybody knew who they were and what their role was on the team. There was no question marks. And right. you, go, you can go talk to him about anything, and he'll talk to you and explain it to you. And it mm -hmm. was, you know, and I always thought Rojas could be an amazing manager. Right. Um, but that was a difference maker that year for a lot of us. I mean, McNeil was on my team yeah. too, and he wasn't, he wasn't hitting great either. You know, and then at a certain mm -hmm. point, we realized where we were in the lineup and we, it wasn't going to change. We all got called up. The whole group of us got mm -hmm. called up to high A yeah. that year, and, and we won the championship. So I just think that's something this game is not doing anymore. Uh, people, yeah, people don't I, know. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I, you know, I, I like the consistency of knowing – as a player, where I'm going to be every day in the lineup. Like I said earlier, you know, one day I'm hitting seven, stuck in the next day I'm hitting second, mm -hmm. then I'm going to third, then sixth, and they start to wonder, like, am I doing something wrong? But it's a, but to understand from the manager's point of view, when you're not winning, he's trying to juggle a lineup as well. So sometimes you have to stay with that plan, mm -hmm. you know, and let it work itself out, which it usually mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have the talent to, to do that, it doesn't matter where you hit in the lineup. It's, just, yeah. it, it, it's not going to be there, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I you know, I, I know you both know that you like to know where you're hitting in the lineup. It's just a comfortability factor, you know. Some guys, a lot of guys, will say publicly, "I, I don't care where." Yeah, yeah, they, mm -hmm. yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. You know, yeah. and it's not being selfish. It's just that. Um, you know, you, you kind of get caught in that zone when you're playing, you know, in the lineup every day. You know where you're going every day, every day you're playing. You know, this, this game of baseball is such a hard sport to play over the course of a year. I think it's the toughest sport by far, not the most physical part of the game. Um, you know, you know, if you take basketball, football, and hockey, it being more physically challenging. But over a course of a year, playing 162 games in like 180 two or four days mm -hmm. uh, there's no time to rest but we're creatures of habit and we need to play every day it's mm -hmm. just how our mindset is from when we were a kid when you get into pro ball you just play every day every day and and that's what we need to do so baseball is, is a grind man it just it wears you down you know you guys both know it's not so much physically as mentally mm -hmm. to wear you down and you know and in this city that happened yeah. very quickly. Well, hopefully, you mentally strong to play in this city. Well, hope, There's no other city. Hopefully, the Mets and the Yankees figure it out soon and take off the rest of the year. Um, but until then, it's been great insight. Thanks to the to the great Mazzo for joining us on the lineup. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.